As the newest and fastest growing warfighting domain, space has become crucial to the United States' technological dominance on a global scale. In this interview, we spoke with Dr. Aaron Weiner, Director of the Advanced Systems and Technology Directorate at the National Reconnaissance Office, to better understand the emerging technologies and the global intelligence trends shaping our future. If you enjoy this interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, if you're interested in being featured in our series, please email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Dr. Aaron Weiner, Director of the Advanced Systems and Technology Directorate at the National Reconnaissance Office. Dr. Weiner, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Summer. So tell me more about your role. What are some of your highest priorities right now? Well, uh, that's a great question. And thanks for providing this opportunity to highlight the National Reconnaissance Office and the Advanced Systems and Technology Directorate. Just a little background on what the NRO does for the nation. Uh, we're a DoD agency and component of the intelligence community. And the NRO develops, launches, and or acquires, launches, and operates the nation's uh, satellites that provide our eyes and ears in space. And to that end, our vision is to see it, hear it, and sense it. And that enables our mission to secure and uh, expand America's intelligence advantage. So our capabilities uh, and the data that our systems collect, as well as the situational awareness they provide, have proven invaluable to analysts, warfighters, and policymakers. Uh, specific to my role within the NRO, I'm both the Chief Technology Officer and Director of the Advanced Systems and Technology Director. So in that role, my charge is to discover and then mature uh, the technologies that enable the intelligence advantage uh, that our systems provide. I have a responsibility to deliver both evolutionary and revolutionary capabilities. And what that means is both find those incremental uh, improvements that we can put into our architectures that we're building now, uh, but also keep an eye out uh, on a, even a 20 year horizon to find those truly disruptive technologies that are going to be game changers for us, but are going to take a while to mature and bring in uh, to, the, to the NRO. As far as my highest priorities, uh, the development of our technical workforce is, is chief among them. Um, you know, as we, uh, I think what hallmarks the NRO over our 60 plus year history is a highly skilled, uh, deep technical workforce that uh, understands the requirements and the technologies required to achieve those and to really partner with industry rather than be a customer to industry, partner with them in these designs and in the build and execution of our systems. And when we encounter you know, difficult problems uh, in those in those system builds, uh, we can truly kind of innovate together what those solutions need to be to get those delivered in space. And uh, in this uh, current uh, climate, uh, there's a lot of uh, not even aerospace companies that are competing with us for essentially the same pool of talent. So to the extent that we can uh, recruit and attract uh, those, those uh, highly skilled um, uh, technical folks, and provide paths for them to get advanced degrees, provide training and things like that, um, that's gonna continue that, that tradition that we've had of that, that technical excellence. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm really looking to leverage the significant private and uh, public investment in R&D, again, to find those truly disruptive uh, technologies that we can get in on the ground floor and bring those into the NRO. I'd like to ask you more about those technologies, and I'm curious, which emerging technologies do you feel will have the greatest impact on our standing in the global power competition in the next few years? And where are you seeing those most promising opportunities for accelerated, meaningful tech growth in the U.S.? The two technologies that I would highlight are the same for, for both, whether they're um, the greatest impact in the great power competition as well as the meaningful tech growth for the U.S. And honestly, um, you know, when I look across, it's artificial intelligence and, and microelectronics. And so, uh, you know, from an artificial intelligence or AI perspective, um, you know, look at ChatGPT, right? That's been in the news quite a bit. Um, and for those that don't know, you know, you can write a, a whole story with just minimal prompting and, and whatever style you want. Uh, it can create recipes. We had a coworker try that out with some mixed success, some good, some bad. Um, we, uh, uh, it, there's technology to actually write pieces of code that go into software that allow us to accelerate the software development process. Um, you know, and as a society, I think what's clear in the reporting is that we're, we're, we're working through how to best incorporate these capabilities uh, into, you know, a place in modern life. And, you know, best case, they allow, uh, you know, us to pursue higher value added activities uh, while, you know, at a faster pace, essentially with broader reach. Um, but it'll be a bumpy path to get there. So we've been following that closely. 
uh, over the years that has resulted in developments like this. And uh, there's significant advantages, we think, in maturing these technologies that will, uh, for example, result in autonomous operation in of our collection architectures. And that would be a huge step forward. Uh, this includes both automation of the satellite functions itself, but also uh, you know, limited decision making and what they call inferencing. So the ability for our collection architectures to essentially make decisions on how they pursue the collection of the intelligence data that we, that we go after. Um, ultimately, ultimately, where we'd like to go is a system that addresses uh, the key intelligence questions that the analysts and the community are asking or that the warfighter needs addressed. And the system develops an automated strategy to orchestrate our satellites to be able to go after and collect the information we need across the architecture and incorporating uh, eventually assets that our partners bring uh, as well. You know, another of my, of my priorities is, is finding quick wins. And I think in this area, both automation as well as some machine learning techniques, uh, we're going to be able to harvest some quick wins out of those and break, uh, develop those into our operational systems uh, to make sure that in the near term, we continue to increase our advantage. I'll say, um, as far as microelectronics, you know, developing a robust uh, domestic supply chain of microelectronics in the two to three nanometer feature size is going to be key both to our commercial advantage as well as our national security advantage going forward. And the CHIPS Act uh, was approved to do just that. And so right now we're eagerly partnering uh, across government to find out how we can uh, quickly essentially achieve those ends uh, to, to help there. And uh, these devices from an NRO perspective will greatly increase the smarts uh, of our satellites and allow them to do more value added activities on orbit. I'm curious about the changes you've seen in the global intelligence landscape during your time with NRO. And what implications do some of those shifts have on American intelligence today? Well, our competitors are becoming more sophisticated. We've seen that. Our, our, our competitors are developing both uh, solutions on, on the ground and in space that are really meant to you know, put our systems at risk and ultimately to erode the intelligence advantage that we have now from space. Um, and then the war in Ukraine, uh, that essentially put a spotlight on um, both interoperability uh, with our, 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 of course, U.S. partners, but also our international partners and what's becoming a growing uh, base in the number of nations that want to partner with us to ensure our, our collective security. It's also highlighted the need for a responsive collection system uh, that delivers decision-ready information uh, and situational awareness at speed where it matters most. And so there's a couple things to unpack there. First, um, you know, decision-ready information, that's different than data. The warfighter and the analysts and the policymakers don't need more data. What they need is decision-ready information. So that implies a value-added level of processing that we need to be able to provide. And then getting the data where, or getting that information where it needs to go implies a much broader communications infrastructure where we have at our, our, our place in choosing can put down uh, information where it's gonna make the most difference. As far as another change kind of in the global landscape, uh, I look at the commercial launch industry. Uh, just in the last several years, there's been several new entrants into that, which is very exciting from, from our perspective. Uh, they brought a lot of innovation. They brought multiple, multiple different methods to, to launch across multiple different sizes and mass classes uh, over multiple locations globally. And ultimately for us, uh, we look at that, that provides a measure of resiliency. Um, we have multiple launch options across multiple places. Uh, it lowers the cost because of all that competition. And it also increases opportunities to get to space. So when we look at you know, ultimately that changes the way we architect our systems going forward. You know, pre previously when launch costs essentially as much as or uh, close to what a satellite would cost to build, uh, we want to make sure it has lots of missions on it and lots of capabilities and that um, it will survive for a long period of time because we don't get to launch them very frequently due to the prohibitive cost. Um, what that does is that drives complexity, which drives cost and mass and forces us to even larger rockets. Uh, what this launch uh, market has now allowed uh, to happen is basically provide a pivot to proliferated systems where companies like SpaceX and Amazon and other smaller companies are now putting hundreds, if not thousands of satellites up. So there's regular launch revisits, but ultimately they've commoditized, uh, I'll, I'll say that loosely, they've commoditized uh, part of the space industry. Whereas before our satellites were essentially individual works of art with really intense human labor to put them together. We now have production lines for key components that enable uh, operations in space and even larger units like the, the vehicle's bus. And so, uh, you know, what that does is allows us to diversify our collection systems. And so rather than have multiple missions on one vehicle, we can diversify those missions across multiple vehicles, which allows uh, different rates of coverage so we can get more uh, area, we can cover more area more frequently. 
Uh, it allows us to, again, do that, uh, achieve that goal of bringing data down where we need it to go, that information that's critical, um, as well as uh, share at multiple security levels to get the information where it can go to our partners, uh, where they can best use it. And so ultimately, you know, to that end, that's a whole paradigm shift from where we've been as a, as a broader community, both in the NRO and uh, with our partners. And uh, it's going to require a change in mindset. And that's a culture shift. I think with any adoption of new technology, as you all know, um, you know, there's a shift to recognize what is my new role in this way going forward. And we're working through that together. So, Dr. Weiner, given these factors, um, the commercialization of space, the ubiquity of launch, how is as and partnering with industry? No, that's a, a, another good question. The, uh, I think that's a, that's a hallmark for as and I think we, we have multiple methods to partner with industry. And of course, we know we have our existing partners in government and, 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 and academia, but I need to get closer, as I talked about previously, to where those seeds of innovation, those disruptive technologies are happening and uh, transition them into the NRO. And we need to grow partners in academia and non-traditional commercial partners who wouldn't have thought to work with us as part of their business model, but maybe there's there's a fortuitous kind of relationship there. And we have several mechanisms to do that. The first one is uh, other transaction authorities, uh, which we've been using more of lately. And what that allows us to do is kind of the best of both worlds. We partner with a traditional kind of aerospace uh, provider who has the know-how and infrastructure to get things into space with a non-traditional provider who has a good idea or concept or an emerging technology. And the two together can mature that and get that in space. And we get to be the reap those benefits. Uh, we also host monthly industry days. So all of the as and leadership uh, provides a call-in opportunity for industry, of course, at the classified level, to be able to talk to us about the new concepts they're working on, the new ideas, and for us to assess how that may fit into our, our plans going forward. We also have the, um, the NRO Acquisition Center of Excellence host a website uh, called the Acquisition Research Center, or, or ARC, on NRO.gov. And what people can do is, is go there and find the NRO's innovation web portal, and they'll learn about how they can do business with the NRO and submit ideas. And some of those ways we collect ideas is through the Director's Innovation Initiative and broad agency announcements, where we put out kind of areas that we're interested in, and any company can respond and uh, find out, you know, or respond to the areas that we're, we're asking for and tell us what, what they can offer. And there's various funding opportunities associated with that. Finally, a, uh, a plug for our uh, tech forum coming up this summer, uh, May 31st through June 2nd, I guess a little bit before summer. Uh, and the theme this year is NRO's hard problems and how we can partner to, to solve those problems. And so this is a little different than those that may be familiar with this uh, venue in the past. So we're having all of our acquisition partners in the NRO essentially tell industry or tell academia and who's ever in the audience what our hard problems are and where if I identify ways where industry, academia, and again, those non-traditionals can partner with us to solve those problems. Uh, I'll highlight another new change this year is on June 2nd, the last day, we're hosting uh, the, the tech forum here at where I'm at today, which is called the Castle. This is a site located just off campus from the NRO down the street. It's a completely unclassified facility, and we'll have uh, people from the NRO with poster boards, essentially poster sessions, to uh, talk to folks in industry who've never worked with the NRO before, don't have any clear uh, uh, a workforce and uh, learn more about what our problems are and where they might be able to partner with us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weiner, you mentioned the seeds of innovation that you are looking for. Can you tell me more about ASNT's model for transitioning technologies from concept to reality and how effective is it? Yeah, and this this model that ASNT has for transitioning these technologies, I think, is is the high point for ASNT. It's something that uh, you know, as an organization, are very good at. Um, you know, there's a phrase associated with technology development called uh, "crossing the valley of death." And so, this is the idea that I've, I've developed a technology. It's the better mousetrap, but the users on the other side, our customers, either don't see the value or or don't see it that as a compelling uh, reason to make a change. And so, that's what we call tech push. So that's, you know, again, trying to push these new innovative things onto, onto our, our, our customers. Um, where we are with our model for transition is tech pool. And the way we do that is we partner with our acquisition directorates that are uh, building the nation's ears, eyes, the communication infrastructure, and ground systems to produce our collection architecture. And we live with them. We have an arm of ASNT that lives within each of those groups. And they really understand the, the culture, the requirements, the systems they're building. They're able to assess the gaps that they have that can be met with new technology needs. 
um, or just innovations, new concepts or ideas on how to use what we already have or repurpose them to get a better outcome. And so uh, with, that, with that model and the trust that they've built, uh, you look across ASNT's 25 year history within the NRO, and we have uh, pieces of our DNA, uh, technology and innovation in, in virtually every single one of the major systems that we've built over those 20, or the DNRO has built and fielded in those 25 years. And I think that's a fantastic track record. In fact, Dr. Scalise, our director, commented recently that ASNT is the most effective R&D organization at being able to cross the innovation chasm, so another word or another phrase for valley of death, to bring new technology to fruition. And, and obviously, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so with us, you know, maturing that broader way of technologies, uh, recognizing not every one of those is going to be destined to an NRO satellite system whether it's just not the right time for that requirement and where we are in our, in our build, um, we find partners in, uh, in, or in, I'm sorry, in government, other space agencies, for example, or the agencies that can use this technology, or um, industry, uh, transition to industry, and either they can incorporate those into systems farther down the line to serve us or other uh, government customers, but ultimately it increases our, our national capability and our advantage in space. Um, of course, a facet to this is, is our partnership across all of the R&D components of the IC and DOD, and the national and federal labs. And we look, we kind of work together again to find those, those promising technologies and find those applications for our systems and bring them into the NRO. Well, Dr. Weiner, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at NRO. Well, thank you, Summer. I appreciate the opportunity. 